This morning is God's good witness. God's good witness. And our text is Acts chapter 14, and we're picking up the narrative now in verses 8 through 20. God's good witness, Acts 14, 8 through 20. And we've been going through the book of Acts, and we've been looking at the many ways that God has provided himself a witness. And this is picked up. Uh, I just think this is a beautiful, artful, wonderful, glorious understatement in Scripture in verse 17 where the passage says, Nevertheless, God did not leave himself without witness. In that, he did good. Yes, and amen. All God's people say amen. Praise God for his witness. Praise God for his revelation to us. Praise God for his word. Praise God for the person that shared the gospel with you when you were converted. Um, Praise God for the preaching of his word. Praise God for the teaching of his word. Praise God for brothers and sisters who are walking testimonies of God. God did great in that he did not leave himself without a witness. And we're going to see today in God's word three examples of that. One, you have a, a, a reality of God's witness through his power. And we're going to explain that more carefully as we look at verses 8, 9, and 10. You also see God's witness brought through the preaching of God's word. And then finally, through the immense long-suffering and patience of God, despite mankind, and maybe yours at one time, your wicked rebellion against him, or your wicked rejection of that message. God is extremely, exceedingly long-suffering and patient. And in all of that, we're going to see that God did good in not leaving himself without a witness. Because as a result of that witness, people can be saved. You're sitting here today as a result of the witness that God has left for you, that God's left for me. And in that, God did great. God did wonderful. God did good. And so let's get right to it. In verse 8, point one on your notes, God's witness comes in multiple ways. But here we're going to see an example, beginning in verse 8, that God's witness has come through the power of God. And here the power of God seen through the healing of a lame man. Chapter 14, verse 8. And in Lystra, a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting, a cripple from his mother's womb who had never walked. Now, the, the, the apostles here, and we'll talk about that term in a moment, Barnabas and Paul made the trip from Iconium now to Lystra. They've come from Antioch to Antioch toward Pisidia to Iconium, thrust out of Iconium by organized persecution, and now they've come to Lystra. And what are they going to do in Lystra? What do you think? They're going to preach the gospel. They're going to start preaching again because that's the pattern. That's what they've been commissioned to do. That's what they're to do. They are God's witness. And so they're going to preach the the gospel in Iconium. They made the 35-mile trek again across rough terrain through dangerous territory to get to this city. Why do we keep emphasizing the fact that it was rough terrain or emphasizing the fact that it was a difficult journey? They made this journey by foot. They continue to travel by foot. And it's dangerous territory Listen, nothing is going to stand in the way of Paul and Barnabas accomplishing the work that God has given them to do. God has commissioned them. They were called out of Antioch by the Holy Spirit, set apart for the work of the Lord, which we said was evangelism, and they are set to that work, and it's going to get done. Paul and Barnabas are witnesses of God. They're witnesses that God has given to preach Christ to the Jews, preach Christ to the Gentiles, and today in Lystra, they're going to be preaching the gospel to as one commentator said, backwoods, backwater heathens. <laughs> These folks, are, they're, they're not sophisticated. Uh, they're not educated like the ones that Paul is going to run into in Athens when he goes to, to Athens. These are just folks out in the woods, just sort of like us out here in the sticks, that God has been gracious to and bringing the gospel to. But this is done according to God's regular pattern, according to the program that God has already set up. And we've seen that very clearly. Flip back to Acts chapter 3, and I want to give you an example of this now. We've we've seen this man here already in verse 8, sitting at the gate, and this man is about to be miraculously healed. And this is in accordance with God's predetermined plan. God is not a God of confusion, amen? God is a God that works according to orderly patterns, according to orderly programs. God is a God of order. And here, this is just an order, again, that we see set up here that is to be for our admonition. And I want you to see that. Acts chapter 3, and look at verse 1. And see the similarities here. Now, Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. 
And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, see that same circumstance, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple. Here, Paul and Barnabas are at the gate of the city. And that temple was called Beautiful. To ask alms from those who entered the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on him, Peter did, with John, Peter said, look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Uh, He was about to get something he didn't expect and praise the Lord for it. Verse 5, so he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand, lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, and look what he did, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. Now we see Peter in Acts 3 perform this miracle with this lame man who was laid outside the gate of the temple begging alms. Here in Acts 14, you've got a lame man, lame literally in the Greek, from his mother's belly, laying at the gate of the temple, begging for alms, but this lame man was about to receive a miracle. This lame man was about to be healed. This is in the pattern of Peter, but I also want you to remember this is in the pattern of Jesus Christ. In Luke 5, you have the the account of Jesus healing the paralytic man, the lame man that was dropped through the ceiling, right? Remember that story in Scripture? He was dropped through the ceiling, and Christ healed him in the same way, lame. The reason we point this out is for this reason. The work of Christ here is shown to be going on. Christ began the work healing, attesting to his message, authenticating who he was through the miracle, doing the work of the Lord, healing that man, and then salvation was always connected. He healed him of his lame condition and then saved him. That work was continued by Peter. We see that in Acts 3, a man lame from birth. God gave Peter through Peter, healed the lame man. He was healed of his condition and he was saved. Now here today in Acts chapter 14, Paul continuing the same orderly work, the same orderly pattern, going to heal a man at the city gates and this man's going to be saved. Now, That all to say that this is the pattern in the same way that Christ began that work. Peter continued that work, and now Paul continues that work. The work of the Lord continues to go on even though Christ was crucified. And Christ is ruling and reigning from heaven, and his work continues. Now that has exhortation and admonition for us. If that work continued from Christ to Peter to Paul, and now Paul is our example saying, imitate me as I imitate Christ, that work continues through you. In the same way that God has done great in leaving a witness through Paul and Barnabas to these folks in Lystra, God has done great, if you're a disciple of Christ, in leaving a witness through you to the people of this area. And we're going to say, see, in this passage, these healings, these miracles in Scripture have a component that applies to us today. It has a spiritual reality to it. In the same way that this man is laying at the gate, lame, crippled from his birth, there are folks within a stone's throw of this building who are spiritually lame and spiritually crippled who need God's witness in order to be saved. And how does that witness come to them? In the same way that it came to this lame lame man at the city gate, spiritually blind, Through Paul and Barnabas, it comes through you to them. And that is God doing good in leaving them a witness. We'll see that more as we go forward. But now here in verse 8, there are certain things that are emphasized, and I want you to see that. First thing it says is that he was without strength in his feet. Literally, that means without ability. This man being lame, without strength in his feet, crippled, literally in the Greek, from his mother's belly, who had never walked. Now think about it for a moment never taken a step, never stood upright on his feet, never was able to support himself on his legs. And this is emphasized to show that this is a great miracle. This is a great miracle that's about to take place. And what happened? As soon as he was healed of this, he leapt, he sprang up. What happened in Acts 3 with Peter? He leapt, he sprang up with Christ and the paralytic in the house. He leapt, he sprang up. And you better believe it, he was skipping and he was running and he ran and he ran and he, everywhere he went, he walked. No, thank you, I won't take the horse. I'm gonna walk. 
It was, it, this was an awesome miracle. From his birth, he had never taken a step, right? Never taken a step. That's emphasized for a reason, and I want you to see this. But this is God bringing the witness here, the 35-mile journey to Iconium to this lame man, and then by implication here, it's going to be to this audience uh, that is about to hear this sermon also. Look at verse 9. This man heard Paul speaking. Now, I want you to see this account didn't begin with a healing. This account began with the preaching of God's word. When Paul shows up in Lystra, in Lystra here, he goes to the city gates. And that says that there probably wasn't a synagogue in Lystra. We know that his program, we've seen that in the past already, was to go straight into the synagogue, start preaching to the Jews first and then into the Gentiles. Now he goes to the city gate and there is no synagogue. What is he doing? He's just open air preaching. We've seen multiple ways that the gospel gets spread, and one of the ways that it gets spread is through open-air preaching. It's the right thing to do. There was no synagogue. The Jews weren't there, which tells you there wasn't a large Jewish influence. There wasn't even in this town a large Greek or a Roman influence because they're going to be speaking Lyconian. But this shows you that Paul does what he needs to do. He goes to the gate of the city, and just like Mark was talking about in the testimony this morning, he just starts trying to reach as many people as he can through open-air preaching. Paul is a faithful witness. So this began with the preaching of God's Word. Now, this preaching of God's Word is going to arouse something in this man. Look further at verse 9. Paul, observing him intently, do you see that parallel with Acts 3 and Peter, looking at him intently, following the same idea. And seeing that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, megalophone, stand up straight on your feet, and he leaped and walked. Now here, Paul, seeing that he had faith to be healed, literally, that seeing that he had the necessary faith to be delivered from the condition that he was in. That word in the Greek is pistis. It literally means saved. But here it means saved or delivered from his condition. Somehow in the preaching of God's word, the preaching of God's word kindled the beginnings, the seeds of faith in the heart of this man. He heard Paul preaching Christ. He heard Paul preaching deliverance. He heard possibly of the, the accounts of Christ saving and healing and walking through the land. And this man the seeds of faith were kindled in him, and he believed that Paul, that God through Paul could heal him. The seedlings of faith were there. And Paul saw that. He observed intently, seeing that he had the faith to be delivered from this condition, said with a loud voice, stand, and, and stand up straight on your feet. Now this, as we've seen in the past, this physical deliverance is also joined with spiritual deliverance. In the same way, when Peter, when Christ, when others healed from physical infirmities, they also healed spiritually. Uh, and that's with purpose also. When Christ, in Luke 5, saw the man being let down through the roof, and he said, your sins are forgiven you, how did the Pharisees respond to that? Well, who does this guy think he is that he can forgive sins? That was a great miracle to forgive sins left for God alone. And what did Jesus Christ say? so that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, take up your mat, rise and walk. Authenticating his message, authenticating who he was, authenticating his authority and his power to forgive sins and do the greater miracle of converting a soul, Christ healed his physical infirmity. It's the same thing that's going on here. Miracles, these miracles are done to authenticate God's message. Miracles were done to authenticate God's messenger so that the greater miracle is seen as being from God, that a soul gets saved, that someone gets converted, that they get transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. They become of their father the devil to sons of the kingdom. That, that is the great miracle. And this is a great miracle that is taking place here. There's a connection saved from physical infirmity, saved from his physical condition, to save now spiritually as well. Uh, this man is about to be saved. Now, he said with a loud voice, stand up straight on your feet. In that, I want you to draw the spiritual parallel here. In that, Paul was challenging him, commanding him. It's an imperative. Stand up straight on your feet, challenging him to do something that in and of himself he knew was impossible to do. 
right? From his mother's belly, he had never taken a step. From his birth, he had never stood up straight on his feet. And here, Paul, challenging him to do something that he couldn't do, that was impossible for him, not impossible for God, through faith. And that's the issue. It's through his faith that the miracle took place. It's through faith that anyone is saved. It's through faith in Christ, the work of God, the grace of God, that anyone can come to Christ. Apart from faith, apart from Christ, we are unable. Now tie those two things together. If you're a sinner, you're in bondage to your sin, you've never turned from your sin and come by faith to Christ, you are depraved. You are as this lame man laying at the gate. You are spiritually unable to stand. You're spiritually unable to see. You're spiritually deaf to the words of Christ. Spiritually unable to do anything of your own to save yourself. You are unable. We looked at last week, that's not a natural inability. That's a moral inability. Just like last week in the sermon, folks don't come to Christ because they don't want to. It's that when the the gospel is preached, disobedience or unbelief says, I won't do it. The command comes from Christ, repent and believe the gospel. Unbelief or disobedience says, I won't do it. And that's exactly what's happening here. When you are depraved in your sin, separated from God, in your natural birth, in Adam, in your, out of your natural flesh, your natural heart, you are unable to stand and walk. You're unable to save yourself. And that's why it's by the grace of God through faith that anyone is saved. Now, this man heard the challenge from Paul, took Paul at his word by his faith, and leapt. He sprung up and he followed Christ. In the same way as depraved, wicked sinners, hopelessly lost apart from the grace of God, by faith, when you hear the command of Christ to leap up in faith and be saved, then by faith you leap up and you accept that. By faith you take Christ at his word. By faith you believe God that he will save you and you set forward following Christ as a disciple by faith in him. And by faith, that's how a person gets saved not by works of your own. You're not going to strengthen your knees, strengthen your ankles, strengthen your legs, straighten your legs and stand up on your own. It's not going to happen. It's all by faith in Christ. Many who have set out on the Christian walk, trying to live the Christian life in their own efforts, know exactly what I'm talking about, have fallen on their face, miserably defeated by sin. The only way that you're going to come to Christ, the only way that you're going to live the Christian life, the only way that you're going to be saved is by faith turning from your sin, putting all of your hope, all of your trust, all of who you are into Christ. And by faith, the miracle takes place. Now, this is by far a greater miracle. It is by far a greater miracle. It's one thing for a lame man, a crippled man from his birth to stand up and walk. It is another thing altogether for God in God's power to transform a heart through the miraculous work of God, you have drug users made clean. You have drunkards made sober. You have sodomites set free. Derelicts and deadbeats delivered. You have hardened criminals softened. You have hate turned to love. Bitterness turned to compassion. Liars transformed into men of integrity from fornicators to faithful, from lazy to hardworking, from living to please yourself to living to deny yourself and please Jesus Christ, your Lord, from false religion to Christ, from deceived to sanctified by truth, from wicked worry to patience and peace, from emptiness to fullness of joy, from enslaved to sin to hating sin, from hungering and thirsting for self-gratification to hungering and thirsting for righteousness, turning pride and arrogance to humility, from fearful to bold as a lion, from uncaring and unconcerned to a pleading evangelist, from a son of the devil to a son of the kingdom. That is the miracle of God's conversion. That's the miracle far greater than healing a man lame from his birth. That's a miracle of God. And praise God that he hasn't left us without a witness so that we can be saved. If you're here today and you've 
come to Christ by repentant faith, you are a walking testimony of this miracle. You're a walking witness for Christ. Now, sometimes as a result of that, you're also a walking rebuke or a walking reproof. But you're a walking witness to be sure. And we are to be that witness. This is a great miracle. And it's our responsibility. It's incumbent upon us as having that treasure in earthen vessels to be a witness that way. God has done so good in not leaving us without a witness and not leaving this wicked world without a witness. And if you're a disciple of Christ, you are that witness. But that's through the power of God. There is nothing more powerful Nothing that is a greater testimony to the goodness, grace, and mercy of God in saving a soul than the life, the transformed life of someone that he saved. The transformed heart, that working out of that that testimony to him in the life of a believer. That's power. That's power. So we see God's witness, point one, through the power of God displayed in healing this lame man in verses 8, 9, and 10. But now, point two on your notes, we're going to see God and his witness through his preaching, through the preaching of God. Now, we've said that Paul and Barnabas have made this 35-mile trek southeast to, uh, uh, Ico- southeast of Iconium to Lystra. This is the hill country. This is Phrygian hill country. This is hill country in the Galatian wilderness, if you will. This, as one commentator said, the backwater, this is outright first century backwoods heathen paganism that Paul and Barnabas are about to encounter here. I refrain to use the word hillbilly, but that's sort of what we're talking about here. This is, this is out in the sticks, okay? Um, and these people, when they saw this miracle, they, saw, they heard the preaching of Paul, open air preaching, mind you, this is going to get a reaction. These folks had a fit. All right? They got roused up here. They saw something amazing, and they had a reaction. Now, this reaction, if you can imagine, um, in this area with these folks, uh, was born out of legend. There was a story that was told that preceded Paul and Barnabas here, and it hadn't been accounted for very long before they got there, but it was written by a Latin poet named Ovid. And Ovid, writing of this account, talked about a time when Zeus and Hermes visited the Phrygian hill country, this area that Paul and Barnabas are now in, this area of Lystra. Zeus and Hermes come to this Phrygian hill country and they go to a town. They start knocking on doors to see who would receive them, and no one would. Knock on a door, rejected. Knock on a door, rejected. Zeus and Hermes, their gods, were being rejected until they come to the door of a house of a person named Philemon and his wife, Balkis. Philemon and Balkis take them in, take care of them. And so Zeus and Hermes, to reward them, take Philemon and Balkis up to a mountaintop overlooking the town, and Philemon and Balkis get to watch the town flooded and all the people in the town killed because they rejected Zeus and Hermes. But because Philemon and Balkis had received them in, they saw their house turned into a glittering gold temple And then Philemon and Balkis were made priests to Zeus and Hermes. Now this story was told, this legend got started, and they believed this. There were inscriptions found in Lystra 300 years later that were from the 3rd century that there were still Zeus and Hermes worship going on in this location at that time 300 years later. They worshipped Zeus and Hermes. They had a temple to Zeus that was there on the location. So this was serious business to them. They were fully entrenched, fully minded in their idolatry. Uh, They were fully born into this feudal idolatry that Paul and Barnabas are about to rebuke. So now their reaction here wasn't unusual. Look at verse 11. Now when the people saw what Paul had done, they raised their voices saying in the Iconian language, now this is their language, the Lyconian language. They weren't speaking Greek. Um, There wasn't a large Roman influence there. Uh, This was their own language. The gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. And Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes because he was the chief speaker. Then the priest of Zeus, whose temple was in front of their city, brought oxen and garland to the gates, intending to sacrifice with the multitudes. Now here, when this happened, they didn't even realize what was going on. It took Paul and Barnabas until verse 13, verse 14 to understand what was happening because they didn't speak Lyconian. 
And so they didn't fully figure out what was going on until they started seeing the oxen come and the priest of Zeus come with a garland, and then they figured it out. But now here, first, in verse 11, the gods have come down in the likeness of men. They tied this account of Zeus and Hermes to Paul and Barnabas here, uh, and they believed this. They were not going to make the same mistake that was made before. They were going to do this right, and they were going to treat Paul and Barnabas with the reverence they thought they, would, they should have been treated so that their town didn't get flooded, and that's why they reacted this way. Uh, they were going to do this right. But they cried out in Lyconian. Paul and Barnabas didn't originally understand. But here we see from this account right off the bat that they are making a grave error. And that error is made today. It's made in churches all over the place today. And that is confusing the power of God with the person or the messenger or the tool or the witness of God. It's attributing the works of God to a man. It's seeing God do amazing things and attributing that to man. This church wasn't created, developed, grown, matured by a man. Christ instituted this church. Christ teaches this church. Christ matures this church. Christ develops this church. Christ preaches through this church. This is Christ's church that he purchased with his own blood. This is the body of Christ. When we see God do miraculous things in countries with the gospel, it's not that man that's doing anything. That's the work of Christ in that place. When someone gets genuinely saved, that's not the, the evangelist that does that. He's simply the tool. That is Christ that saves. Christ deserves all of the glory. God deserves all of the glory for that. Oftentimes today, the reverse of that is also true in charismatic churches. You see a supposed miracle being done, and that guy is sucking all the glory out of that fake miracle, taking glory away from God. All glory belongs to God, and they make the same mistake here. They confuse the true source of power with the lame healer <laughs> that God is using. Uh, men at best are men at best, <laughs> and God decides to use them. Uh, but here, immediately, Paul and Barnabas recognize this, and they set off to set the record straight. Right away, they're going to set the record straight. Look at verse 14. But when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard this, they tore their clothes and ran in, ran in among the multitudes. Now, they're called apostles here. That's not apostles, the office, but that word is intended to communicate the authority that comes with being a sent one of God. Paul and Barnabas were separated by the Holy Spirit for the work of the Lord, and so that word apostle literally means sent one in the Greek. That's a way of communicating the authority that they had as messengers of God. But it says here that they tore their clothes. And that's a, a common expression in Scripture. And that expression, that symbol or that gesture is used to communicate great horror or great anger at blasphemy or great grief, great sadness. And we see this throughout Scripture. It began actually in Genesis. And to give you an example, in Genesis 37, 29, Reuben returned to the pit where they had thrown Joseph and indeed, Joseph was not in the pit, the Bible says, and Reuben tore his clothes. In Numbers 14, 6, but Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, when they came back from spying out the land, and the Israelites were afraid and would not, by faith in God, charge in and take that land because God had given it to them, it says that Caleb and Joshua tore their clothes. Remember in, in Judges 11, Jephthah's vow. In verse 30, And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will indeed deliver the people of Ammon into my hands, then it will be that whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the people of Ammon shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up as a burnt offering. Now what a foolish vow to make. And we see how foolish it is. Verse 34 continues, When Jephthah came to his house at Mizpah, there was his daughter coming out to meet him with timbrels and dancing. And she was his only child. Besides her, he had neither son or daughter. And it came to pass when he saw her, his great grief, he tore his clothes. And he said, Alas, my daughter, you have brought me very low. You are among those who trouble me, for I have given my word to the Lord, and I cannot go back on it. And remember the, the testimony of Christ at his 
false trial, that kangaroo court, where in Matthew 26, Mark 14, when Christ is making the pronouncement that he is the Messiah, and it says that wicked high priest tore his clothes at supposed blasphemy. This happens throughout Scripture. And here, happening, because Paul and Barnabas see this as great blasphemy. A great error has taken place. The work of God being attributed to them, in their minds, great blasphemy. And it is great blasphemy. This is the kind of thing, all of that belongs to the Lord. The Lord gives us everything. The Lord sustains us. The Bible says he sustains all things by the word of his power. If God ceased to think of you for a second, you would wipe yourself out of existence. God sustains everything, this entire universe, by the word of his power, all glory to God. And here, uh, they're not going to allow that to be done for them. They're not going to allow them to sacrifice to them. They're going to do everything they can to stop it. Now, this reminds me of a contrast here. Remember going through Acts, in Acts 12, we saw the reaction of Herod. Remember how opposite that was, and what did God do? God ate him out with worms. Uh, Herod took all of that glory to himself, um, and that glory belongs to God alone. Um, It also reminds me of, in in a way, James 5. When Paul and Barnabas, they rush into the crowd, they said, men, why are you doing these things? We are also men with the same nature as you. In James 5, 17, James talks about that with Elijah, that Elijah prayed and he shut up the heavens without rain, and he was a man of the same nature as us. God works through men. God is the one who performs the miracle. God is the one who answers the prayer. God is the one who saves. Uh, It's not men that do that. And so they're going to do everything they can do here to try to stop this sacrifice from taking place. And it begins now, this continued sermon of Paul to these folks in Lystra. And he begins to preach. Look at verse 15. Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men with the same nature as you. And preach to you that you should turn from these useless things to the living God who made the the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all things that are in them. This sermon here continues, and the first point of the sermon is for them to turn and to turn from their wicked idolatry. These folks in Lystra were engulfed in idolatry. They were submersed in idolatry, and we have the same problem today, and I want you to see that. But notice here first that in this sermon, Paul and Barnabas don't start where they usually started. Usually when they went into the synagogue, as we've seen already, they started with the history of Israel, they started with the, the promises of God to the, Israelites, the Israelite nation and the deliverance of a Messiah to them, the, the raising of a Savior through Jesus Christ, the promised messianic deliverer. Here, they don't start there. Here, they start by telling them, listen, you need to turn away from this worthless, useless, mindless idolatry that you're involved in and turn to God who created everything. Now, this is another example, like we talked about last week, of how Paul and Barnabas so spoke in such a manner that a great many believed, here they're doing the same thing. They don't stick to just the same cookie-cutter, formulaic approach to preaching the gospel here. They talk to these folks in Lystra exactly in the way they needed to be talked to. They needed to hear from this point. Same thing with us. When you're sharing the gospel, if you're going to speak in such a way or you want to speak in an effective way or in such a manner like we talked about last week, you're going to share the gospel in a way that they need to hear it. If you're talking to someone who has never heard of the Bible, never heard of Christ, doesn't know anything, I don't even know that there was a Bible, then you're going to begin with creation, with their creation, with God. We don't usually have that problem where we're witnessing because 85 or 90% of the people we run into are Christians already. And so when you're speaking to them, you're going to start in a different place, just like Paul and Barnabas did with the Jews in the synagogue. Here, they tailored their deliverance of the gospel here uh, to meet the needs of their pagan audience. This was a pagan, these were true pagans. And this is the first time, really, that we're going to see this take place. Remember, the Ethiopian eunuch wasn't a pagan, he was a God-fearer. When Peter shared the gospel with Cornelius, he was a God-fearer. Here, these are just down, backwards, heathen pagans. (laughs) then they need to hear the gospel uh, in this way. And so the very first thing that Paul and Barnabas say here, Paul preaches, is they should turn from their worthless things. Worthless things here is idolatry. This reminds me of 1 Thessalonians 1.9. 1 
When the Bible says, For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living, you see that, and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. This emphasis on living God is to contrast with their dead idols, you see. We serve a living God, amen, not the figment of our own imagination. Um, These are worthless for a couple of reasons. This idolatry is considered a worthless, useless thing for a few reasons. One is that it provokes God to anger. In Jeremiah 1.16, God says, I will utter my judgments against them concerning all their wickedness because they have forsaken me, burned incense to other gods, and worshipped the works of their own hands. Idolatry in any form provokes God to anger, right? Secondly, it's worthless because it's good for nothing. It's ineffectual. In Habakkuk 2.18, the Bible says, what prophet is an idol when its maker has shaped it? A metal image, a teacher of lies, for its maker trusts in his own creation when he makes speechless idols. They are good for nothing, cannot save. And third, because they are deceptive. Often in Scripture, there is a warning to even not to marry foreign wives because the Israelites can be led astray into idolatry, led astray into worshiping those things that are not gods. And when you worship things that are not gods, the Bible says you're worshiping demons. But now the reason that applies, and it applies this way, is because this idolatry still goes on today. This idolatry in numerous ways continues to this very day and will continue. In Revelation 9.20, this is Revelation, the end times, right? The last days, and it says, But the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. This idolatry continues today and continues into the future. Sometimes we can think to ourselves, well, what is foolishness to serve, I mean, worship sticks and stones, you know, worship gods of your, you know, little carvings that you've made yourself, you know, with one half of the wood, you carve out a God, and with the other half of the wood, you build a fire to make your bread, like the Bible says, just the foolishness of idolatry, but this idolatry continues today. It continues through Hinduism, with its myriad of gods, rat gods, and rock gods, and egg gods, I mean, just utter foolishness, utter idolatry. It continues in Buddhism, but it also continues in Islam, And in the sense that it continues in Islam is this, that that God that is being worshipped is not the God of the Bible. It is a God of a man's imagination. It is fabricated by a man. It is not the God of the Bible. They worship a different God. And as such, as the Bible says, they're worshipping a demon. But now in the same sense that Islam has done that, Professing Christians do that all the time, right? One way that you engage in idolatry is by having an understanding or a fabrication of God that doesn't align itself with the Word of God. By having um, an idea of God in your head that is not biblical, that is also idolatry. Um, There are those that worship sticks and stones. There are those that worship the creature rather than the creator. But there are also those here in our own day, that worship a God of their own imagination, a God of their own making. The God of the Bible is the one true and living God. There are no other gods besides Him, and it's Him that we worship. But now we also hear idolatry spoke of in a different way. And this word idolatry is made up of two Greek words. One is adol, the root adol, meaning idol, and the other is from latruo, meaning to worship. You've got adol worship, right? It's idol worship, idolatry. And idolatry is basically supreme or even extreme admiration, love, or reverence given to someone or something that is not God, all right? That takes the place in that sense of God. And in our context today, we hear idols spoken of in a lot of different ways. And there's one way to think about idolatry that is dangerous that we need to understand. We hear all the time now in evangelicalism, if you've read or if you listen to sermons, people talking about idols of the heart. And sometimes the intention of that, it's well-intentioned or well-meant, but redefining sin as idolatry can be dangerous for a couple of reasons. Sometimes we talk about idols in our context like this. They are money, sex, power, education, children, leisure time, entertainment, 
Some people have appearance as an idol. Spouse, your spouse can become a, sometimes for some of you, it may be finding a spouse that becomes an idol. Um, free time, family time, work, hobbies, those kinds of things sometimes are spoken of as idols or idols of the heart. But now, thinking about idolatry this way, think about it. When you take sin, which is what it is, and you redefine it to mean, I just have mixed up priorities. I treasure this more than I'm treasuring God, and it'd be better for me if I got my priorities in order and started following God more. You see the, the difficulty of that, the error of that? And you start looking at idols of the heart being, well, I'm not doing, these are good things that I've just taken too far, and you don't think of them anymore as bad things. That's what's happening. It's redefining sin. What this is, when money, when work, when leisure time, when entertainment, when education, when any of these things take the place of serving or loving or worshiping God in any form or fashion, it is sin. It is a defiant, rebellious willful, destructive, deviant proclamation that I will not have this man to rule over me. And idolatry in Scripture is referred to as harlotry. You know what I'm saying by that? It's the, the professing Christian being a prostitute when they are to be married to their Lord. And so this idolatry is a wicked sin. So hear, to hear it talked about as mixed up priorities, or it'd be better for the Christian if they prioritize this. No, it's not just a simple matter of changing priorities. It's not just a simple matter of, of good things taken too far. This is wicked sin. So you imagine for yourself now, think about this. We talk about idols in the heart. You think about maybe the idols that you've set up that take precedence over serving Christ, that take precedence over you fully and completely and totally investing yourself in all that you are into wholeheartedly serving him? And what prevents you from that? What keeps you from that? What have you placed in priority over that? That is idolatry. It is sin. And it is willful rebellion against God. It needs to be thought of that way. There's some that I've heard it defined, uh, adultery. I read this past week. Adultery isn't sin anymore in that sense. It's finding satisfaction and approval in romance with someone else when that should be your wife. That, that is wicked sin. <laughs> and the, the Bible clearly says that. So to re redefine it that way, finding personal self-worth, personal satisfaction in romance with someone else, no, it's sin. It's sin. But there's this move to redefine sin in that way, and we need to be guarded against that. When the Bible talks about covetousness, for example, as being idolatry. Ephesians 5 talks about that. The covetous man who is an idolater. The real image or the real understanding of idolatry starts being revealed. What is covetousness? Covetousness is self-gratification. It is desiring for yourself. And that starts pointing at the issue of where real idolatry comes from. Real idolatry today isn't money, isn't sex, isn't power, isn't education, isn't a spouse, isn't any of those things. The real idol today is self-worship, is self-gratification, self-serving, is living for yourself. In living for yourself, you don't deny yourself and live for Christ. That is the object of idolatry. Think about it in Scripture. Idol worship in Scripture is always directed toward an object, and that object is believed to be able to deliver, be able to talk, to be able to help them, to be able to answer prayer, all falsely, of course, because it's a demon or a stick. And now, today, people worship themselves constantly, and they have as their own idol their own self-gratification, their own needs, their own desires, their own wants. Listen, when you came to Christ, when Christ saved you, if you're a disciple of Christ, it is no longer you that lives, right? Right? The life which you now live, you live by faith in the Son of God. You live for Christ. You are Christ. You are His possession. You're not to live for yourselves. Idol worship today is self-gratification, self-indulgence. And so think about where in your life. That needs to be repented of and dug out. Uh, don't allow that idol. Uh, you need to treat it 
with as much seriousness as Paul and Barnabas here are treating them. They're going to do everything they can to keep them from sacrificing them, sacrificing to them. And they want to tell these uh, folks in Lystra to turn from their idols. The Bible exhorts us to turn from our idols. All right, let's continue. Look down in Acts 14 now at verse 16. And we're going to keep going here. The preaching of God here is such a gracious witness. And he's not abandoned us in this. He's given us this witness. Look at verse 16. And it says, he speaks of God who made the heaven and the earth, the sea, and all things that are in them, who in bygone generations allowed all nations to walk in their own ways. Now that does not mean that he ignored them. When he makes the comment, who in bygone generations, it basically means in the past. In the past, he's allowed nations to walk in their own ways. It reminds me of Acts 17, when Paul goes to Athens, and he's speaking to the Athenians, and he says, God has overlooked these times of ignorance, but now, right? In bygone generations, in the past, this is the way things were done, but now, there's something new coming, this is going to be different, but now God commands all men everywhere to repent. Until the full revelation of Christ came to the Gentiles by God's gracious witness here, God overlooked their error, their sin, because it was in their willful ignorance. He simply overlooked it in their error. But now, through the preaching of Christ, commands all men everywhere to repent. It doesn't mean that he neglected them. doesn't mean that he overlooked their sin doesn't mean that he disregarded their sin, like they're not going to be held accountable for it, like there's no consequence for their sin. It doesn't mean that God ignored their sin, swept their sin under a rug, or turned a blind eye to their sin. This, in one sense, indicates the great patience and long-suffering of God, one, and that God didn't bring quick and fast retribution onto them. But also, I want you to see something else from this. Um, we need to see this as a curse of God. Think about it. When God was with the Israelites, he was with the Israelites for blessing and for salvation. God himself was in the pillar of fire by night, the cloud by day. God's voice thundered from the mountain. They had God's law. God gave them the priesthood. God was with them for blessing, not for cursing. He was with them for good, not for evil. God was with them for their salvation, not for their damnation. But what was going on in all the nations of the world around them at that time? God was not with the Canaanites. God was not with the Amalekites. God was not with the Hittites. God was not with the other nations of the world. Israel was to be a light to the nations. All the nations of the world were to be blessed through Israel. But God, in his abandonment, this was to be seen as a curse. When God was not with them, they didn't have his law. They didn't have his word. And God in their error overlooked their times of ignorance. But now in Christ commands all men everywhere to repent. This is a foreshadowing of judgment. And this is a fearful thing. It is a fearful, frightening state to be abandoned by God. Think about that. The, the, the curse of, of him withholding his grace and his mercy... And we think about it sometimes, the, those that are in the Amazon or in Africa, the question is always, well, how can the pygmy in the backwoods of Australia be saved when they've never heard the gospel, never heard about God, and they die in their sins and they go to, the, go to hell? That's Romans 1, right? Romans 2. They are without excuse because God has not left himself without a witness. God has been good in that. But there are those that need to hear the gospel because you are God's witness, and apart from that witness here, um, they were abandoned. And that abandonment is a judgment on sin. It is to be seen as a foreshadowing of judgment against it. This is a fearful thing. That's a fearful thing. That's why the witness of God is so important. It's not right to say that God will save someone apart from his revelation to them. And that revelation comes through his witnesses, his disciples. It comes through you if you're a disciple of Christ. And there are folks you could walk to right now that are just as without the light of Christ as that person in the backwoods of Australia that's never heard the gospel. You could walk to get to them. And that's God's witness to them. But here, this is God simply in his patience. And it says here that he was good to them. He gives them rain. He gives them harvest. He provides for them. 
This is God being good. But this abandonment here is a foreshadowing of divine judgment against sin. Uh, in Scripture, God was with the Israelites for blessing and salvation. They were to be a witness to the nations. In Romans 1, it talks about that, 18 to 32, when it says that of those that were not thankful, that did not like to retain God in their knowledge, that God gave them up. He gave them up. That's the, the judgment of abandonment. He gave them up to a debased mind, gave them up to their vile passions, to the lust of their heart, the lust of their flesh. Uh, that's God giving them up. Um, if you're here today, if you hear the preaching of God's word, you have a Bible in your hand, God hasn't given you up. Uh, God has been merciful and gracious and good. Uh, there are people here that it will be the grace of God to them that you share the gospel with them. And God is gracious and merciful and good. That's not the judgment of abandonment or the curse of abandonment. That's God's grace and mercy in that he did good and not leaving them without a witness. But if you reject that witness... If you continue to turn a blind eye to it, to, to shove it off, to forcefully put it aside like we saw last week, then you, there will come a point, the Bible says, where my spirit will not always strive with man and you will be given up to a debased mind, given up to the lust of your heart, the lust of your flesh, and God's judgment of abandonment on you. Don't reject Christ when God, being so gracious and so merciful to give you his witness, uh, to turn your back on that is worthy of judgment. It's worthy of abandonment. But we're going to see in point three on your notes that God is incredibly patient. Incredibly patient. God continues to give his witness. And this is a testimony of his goodness and care. A lot of times we have difficulty understanding that God can be both a God of wrath, and like it said, the 14 times in the first 50 Psalms, it says that God hates the sinner. It is not biblically correct to say that God hates the sin and loves the sinner. That's not biblically right to say it. No, the Bible says clearly that God hates the sin and he hates the sinner. But sometimes we get tangled up in our heads with how it can be possible that God can both love and hate or demonstrate his wrath at the same time. We view love and wrath as being mutually exclusive situations. Wrath drives out love, right? Love drives out wrath. But in God, wrath is simply an expression of one of his perfections, which is justice and righteousness. Because God is just, because he is righteous, and because he is holy, then God demonstrates wrath anger and hatred against sin and against the person who commits that sin. That is God in his perfection expressing his perfection through wrath. But God is also in his perfection loving. God is love and he demonstrates his love in the fact that it rains on the just and on the unjust alike. That God even here gives them everything that they've had. Look at verse 17. He did not leave himself without a witness in that he did good. Praise the Lord that even despite wicked rebellion of men, God gave them rain from heaven, fruitful seasons, filling their hearts with food and gladness. That's the rain falling on the just and on the unjust. At the same time that God in his perfections of holiness and righteousness, his perfect justice, expresses his opposition to that in his wrath and in his anger and in his judgment in the same way. And at the same time, they're not mutually exclusive perfections in God. At the same time, God demonstrates his love and his grace and his compassion and his caring on those same people by filling their hearts with food and gladness, by providing for them, by sending the harvest, by sending the rain, by taking care of them, and in his great patience with them, withholding his judgment, and in his great grace and mercy in sending them a witness. So God both loves and God hates, but God hates with perfection. That word hate in our understanding is laden with sin, but there's no sin in that with God. There's perfect love, there's perfect justice, there's perfect love, and there's perfect wrath, there's perfect love, perfect hate in God, and Bible teaches both. But these, God takes care of. Psalm 145, 15 through 16 says, the eyes of all look expectantly to you. That's everyone, sinner, saved alike. And you give them their food in due season. 
You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. That is God's grace and God's mercy, God's goodness. That's God's love. And that is his love poured out even on those. Now listen, this idea of love, you can get yourself into an error, a way of thinking that's simply not biblical, and that's this, that God hates the reprobate, and there's simply nothing that can be done about it. If you're here today and you have this image of God as being some hating ogre against you, that's another example of you worshiping a God that is a figment of your own imagination that's not the God of the Bible. The fact that God, God has done good in that he has left himself a witness to you today. You get to hear God's word. You get to be among God's people. God, the Bible says, is abounding in love, abounding in mercy, abounding in grace. The Bible doesn't say that he is abounding in hatred, abounding in wrath. God wants you to be saved. God desires that all men everywhere repent. So they turn from their sin and put their faith and trust in Christ. And this is God's expression. Listen, God expresses wrath against rebellious image bearers because that is according to his perfections that he would express his wrath, his justice against rebellious image bearers. But God, finding nothing lovely in the object that he demonstrates his love to, if you understand what I'm saying, loves rebellious image bearers in the sense that God in his perfections, is loving. That's the kind of God that he is. And so he provides, and he's patient, and he's long-suffering, wanting you to turn from your sin and put your faith in Christ and be saved. But when you reject, and you continue to reject, and you forcefully push the grace and mercy and love of God aside and continue to persist in your sin, then God, in his perfection of righteousness and holiness and justice, uh, sends you to a deserving judgment. Um, so Paul's exhortation here in this sermon is for them to turn. Turn at this understanding of God. Do not persist in your worthless, futile, vain idolatry. Turn from that sin to Christ. But point three on your notes, we see in all of this the patience of God. God continues in his goodness, mercy, and grace, continues to provide a witness of himself despite wicked rejection, despite wicked rebellion. These folks here in Lystra were so awestruck by this miracle that Paul and Barnabas did everything they could do to try to prevent this sacrifice from happening. And it just shows what a, a mindless, foolish, rebellious, willful, rejecting, blind people we are. That all of this, the miracle of God, the testimony of God, the witness of God, the messengers of God, the word of God, and yet in all that, it took everything they could do just to keep them from sacrificing to them, just to, to keep them, to try to prevent them from their, their idolatry. And yet God continues to send them witnesses, continues to send them witnesses. And here's an example of that. Look at verse 18. With these sayings, with this sermon, this beautiful testimony of God, with this miracle that God performed, they could scarcely restrain the multitudes from sacrificing to them. Then Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there, and having persuaded the multitudes, they stoned Paul, dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. Look at how fickle people are. They go from about to sacrifice to Paul and Barnabas to the next minute stoning him and dragging him out, throwing him out of the city. It's just foolish, fickle uh, people. Uh, this reminds me a little bit of Saul. Paul knew what this is all about. These Jews from Antioch to Iconium to Lystra, it shows you the antagonism of these people against the gospel when they go to make this same arduous journey just to persecute him. They chase him down in Lystra to stone him from Antioch and Iconium. Uh, just shows you their antagonism, but this reminds me of Paul chasing Christians down to Damascus, right? Following Christians out to Damascus to persecute them. This is over a 120-mile journey, and it just shows you how hostile they were to the gospel. Uh, and I remember reading in Galatians 6, remember the passage, Galatians 6, 17, where Paul said, speaking of, I think, this very time here, that he bears in his body the marks of the Lord Jesus here, Paul is bearing the marks of the Lord Jesus. He gets stoned 
and left for dead on a dung heap outside of Lystra, dragged out of the city. That left scars. Literally, in Galatians 16, that word there for marks in his body is stigmata. Uh, it means brands. He's got the branding of Christ on him, the scars, the marks of Christ, of serving Christ. Now, why do we say that? Because the arduous journey, the hostile persecution, the stoning to the point of death, the rejection of godless, pagan, heathen worshipers, the rejection of his own people, the Jews, would not prevent Paul from fulfilling the work for which God has commissioned him. This is a testimony of God's goodness in providing a witness because Paul turns around here, the next day he leaves and goes to Derby, and what do you think that he does there? He preaches the gospel, and people in Derby are going to be saved. This is Paul's faithfulness, his unswerving, uncompromising faith. He goes right back into Lystra out of faith in Christ, out of sheer faith, nothing more. Being stoned, unconscious, scarred, left for dead on a dung pile, he goes right back into Lystra. That's just faith in Christ. And then he turns around and he goes another 60 miles on foot in the condition that he's in the next day, surely in pain, and he goes straight down to Derby and preaches the gospel again. This is just, this is Paul's faith that was granted to him by God. This is a testimony of his faith, but also this is a testimony of the goodness and patience of God in providing a witness. God's good witness. That God provides a witness to his word, God provides a witness to the unswerving nature of saving faith. God provides a witness of the power of conversion, of salvation. And God provides a witness in Paul to those folks in Lystra, to those folks in Derby. And God is so good in providing a witness. And that leaves us with our admonition from that. The exhortation of Scripture to us in that. Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. The things that you've seen and heard in me, do. In Paul here, we see this great example of faithfulness despite any obstacle. Faithfulness to Christ despite any circumstance. And that's just the grace of God. And that we need to take example from that. We need to take admonition from that. This is God's witness to you if you're lost. If you're hearing this passage from Acts 14, you're hearing the teaching of God's Word, this is God's witness to you to be saved, to turn from your wicked, foolish, utterly deplorable, rebellious idolatry of self-worship and to turn to Christ and be saved. But if you're here and you're a disciple of Christ, this is God's good witness to you from the pages of Scripture for you to live the Christian life, for you to view properly your understanding of service to Christ, of the, the work that you've been enlisted to do. You are God's good witness. This should, with Paul's example and the exhortation from Scripture here, charge you up to go out and serve Him with greater and greater faithfulness. Paul bears in his body the marks of serving the Lord Jesus Christ. And some of us won't bear missing our favorite TV show. Some won't bear taking a little time during the week to make sure that you're going to share the gospel with that person who needs a witness. This is God's exhortation, stirring one another up to love and good works, that we as disciples of Christ need to take this example from Scripture, this example from Paul, and to live for Christ. We are God's witness, and God has done good in leaving the lost and dying world a witness, and that witness is you. We've got to serve Christ with that witness that many might be saved. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, God, we praise you and thank you. You have been so gracious, God, so merciful in leaving us a witness, Lord, that we were saved, Lord, that in your grace and your mercy, Lord, that you cleansed us, you washed us clean in Christ, saved our wretched souls. God, thank you for that witness. Lord, thank you for the, the joy, God, and the privilege of being able to participate in your work as a witness, Lord. We've been so gracious in leaving a witness to sinners 
in the same way that we were saved, Lord, there are many, many here that need to be saved. And Lord, praise you, God. Thank you for your witness. Thank you for the faithfulness of your people in sharing the gospel. I praise you and thank you, Lord, for the, just the blessed testimony of this church, the faithfulness of your people, Lord. It's such a blessing, such an encouragement, how they just have a heart for evangelism, a heart to see people saved, a heart to serve you. God, what a great encouragement. What a great blessing. Uh, praise you, God. All glory goes to you. We praise you and thank you for that. And Lord, spur us on just to greater faithfulness um, to you. God, greater faithfulness to the, the witness, Lord, that you've left us for your glory, God, for your great namesake so that souls may be saved. And we love you, Lord. And it's our great joy to, uh, to be able to serve you in this way. Uh, thank you for this time together, God. Thank you for the witness of your word. Apply it by your spirit, God, to our hearts that we might live by it in Jesus' name. Amen.